Hey everybody, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. My guest today is Dion Nicholas. He is the CEO and co-founder of Forethought, the AI company whose mission is to transform customer experiences with human-centered AI. Forethought has raised $90 million in venture capital, was listed in the next billion dollar startups in 2021 and won TechCrunch Disrupt in 2018. Before starting Forethought, Dion built products and infrastructure at Facebook, Palantir, Dropbox, and Peer Storage. Forethought provides customer service solutions that transform the customer experience. Its products enable seamless customer experiences by infusing human-centered AI at each stage of the customer support journey. Today, Dion and I will be talking about how his passion for improving customer experiences started at his after-school job in high school. We'll be talking about why customer service shouldn't be an afterthought and the increasing expectations customers have and how AI empowers agents to work harmoniously. Let's get on to the interview, but before that... Forethought is our sponsor today. For more information, head over to forethought.ai. Dion, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Where are you calling in from today? Blake, thanks for having me. I'm calling in from sunny San Francisco, California. Oh, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I just moved from there to LA. Um, I'm sure your offices are in, are they actually San Francisco or Palo Alto? Um, actually in San Francisco. So I actually live in uh, the south, in the Bay Area, but our office is on the Embarcadero, so it's uh, pretty nice. It's actually sunny for, for once, so it's uh, it's fun. So can you just share with the audience how you started to, how you got involved in this customer service AI tech space? Absolutely. And thanks for the uh, the kind words. So um, I was a little bit of background on myself. I was born and raised in Toronto and Canada um, in kind of inner city Toronto. Um, my parents, we, we didn't have much money. And so in, in high school, I had to, um, you know, work, work a job like anyone else. And my first ever job was actually in customer service. Um, so I was stocking shelves at Shoppers Drug Mart, which if anyone knows is like the Canadian CBS, I guess. And so mm-hmm. um, <laughs> they're answering customer calls, answering customer questions, as well as um, on the floor. Um, meanwhile, um, my I've always been passionate about technology, um, particularly computer science, coding, um, and then eventually AI. And so um, I always had the thought of, well, I don't always have all the answers to every question customers, particularly my customers, um, don't always have all the information they need. Um, And so through a lot of different threads, I always thought about how can technology help people get their questions answered. Um, That uh, and and a few other kind of experiences eventually kind of paved the the, the pathway, so to speak, to uh, founding a company in this space and, you know, AI uh, for customer service and, and beyond. Wow. So you literally were stocking shelves and you just saw a need. You saw a gap in the market. Like there's so much dysfunction, I like to say, in customer service. There's (laughs) such an opportunity. Um, So I've seen your resume. You've interned at some major tech companies, worked for some awesome tech companies, and then you raise $90 million. So how do you get from interning at Facebook to being the boss of your own company? Oh yeah, so it's it's interesting because in my mind, so I never I never thought I would be an entrepreneur. It wasn't something that I was just like I'm gonna go start a company one day. Um, but at the same time, I kind of feel like in hindsight, I've always been building, always been um, doing entrepreneurship in some way, shape, or form. I just didn't realize it at the time. So even going back to you know when I was younger and thinking about problems to solve and thinking about how technology can solve them. Um, that's something that I've I've always been interested in. So, example, like after I had interned at Facebook, um, I caught you know this this uh, this social network bug, and I thought about, for example, okay, what if um, what would a new social network look like? And so, I, um, at the time, I built um, a really silly kind of video social network that I'm going to claim would have been like bigger than TikTok, um, <laughs> but you know, it never, it didn't pan out, but th- there's, there's things like that. So I was, I've always been a builder, um, ever since I learned to code, um, ever since, um, 
you know, I got my hands on on a computer, really, um, just thinking about anytime I see a problem, how can I solve it? And so um, whether that was customer service, whether that was other ideas, um, I had even, when I had started learning more and more about AI, I had built an AI that would help uh, help me study history um, because I was also really bad at that, right? And so in hindsight, I had always had this kind of bug of like, when I see a problem, how can I solve it? Um, eventually, I became a software engineer. As you mentioned, I built products and infrastructure companies like Facebook, Palantir, um, and then uh, Dropbox, and then Pure Storage. And it was actually at Pure Pure Storage, which is a um, data storage company based in Mountain View in California, um, when I started thinking again about this concept of how can AI help people get their most important questions answered. Because um, for myself, even as an engineer ramping up, um, you really realize that a lot of the information is either buried inside of people's heads or scattered across data silos. And then again, spent some time with folks in customer service. I would literally just hang out and get to know the folks, um, but realize that they also had the same knowledge or information problems with respect to ramping up agents and their customers. And so it, it really, that thread, again, it, it kind of brought me back to when I was in customer service or when I was younger and thinking about how can AI help people answer questions. And, and, and like, it kind of never left me. Again, it just like, was like, hey, here's a problem in the world. How can I go and solve it? Um, and so eventually um, left to start Forethought. And it's funny because like Pure Storage is actually one of our uh, really big customers today. Um, so it's exciting to, to get to help solve a problem for, you know, my, my, friend, my friends and people I used to work with. And then also, you know, much um, different companies now, um, including, you know, folks like Instacart and Asana and, and uh, Marriott Homes and Villas, for example. All right. So those are some huge brands. Tell us what you do for them. Absolutely. So um, started Forethought, we launched in 2018. Um, and what we do is we build AI for customer service automation. And we like to think about ourselves as the intelligence layer um, across the entire life cycle of a customer support inquiry. A lot of people, when they think about AI and automation, the first thing you think about is chatbots. The problem, though, with traditional chatbots is that they have been, even though they've been under the moniker of artificial intelligence, in many ways they were a lot more artificial and a lot less intelligent, so to speak. A lot of chatbots are built by keywords, you know, you plug in if-then statements, if I see word refund, go and issue a refund. Um, and at Forethought, we truly care about how can we use AI to help these questions be answered. And so we kind of flip that paradigm on its head. We integrate um, with existing help desk systems, your existing conversation history, and then start using the AI to pull out, okay, how was this question asked? How was this question answered? Um, and then use that to build a system in, in, almost, in a semi-automated way. And so this kind of really changes the paradigm for how these systems get built and uses true AI. So if somebody says, um, hey, you know, you guys suck. My, uh, uh, I just want my money back. That still should translate into the same thing as if somebody said the keyword refund, right? And so our systems are built on this new paradigm of using natural language understanding in order to build true um, customer support automation systems. Mm -hmm. that's, that sounds amazing. And it seems like you have a lot of different clients because you said Marriott, that's travel. You mentioned Asana, which is a software company and Instacart, online grocery. So how do these companies find out about what you are offering? Because I actually understand you've acquired like a ton of customers very, very early. And that's how investors like Ashton Kutcher were attracted to what you're doing. Um, absolutely. So that's a that's a great question. So yeah, we now serve um, over a hundred different um, organizations, high growth technology companies, um, folks in retail, financial services, and so on. Um, I think at its core, uh, it all boils down to the technology. So when we set out, we did not set out to build something that would be for a specific industry or anything like that. We truly wanted to build a system that given the right amount of information, given the data and the conversation history from that industry or from that business, could figure out how to truly answer those problems. And so that actually bears out in the fact that we have all of these different customer segments today, again, from you know hospitality retail um, to software as a service to fintech and so on. Um, and 
we've always just been obsessed about what are the commonalities, the common problems that we see a lot of these businesses have. Because again, despite uh, these companies being in different industries, customer service is a ubiquitous uh, is a ubiquitous problem. And many of the issues, for example, understanding what a customer is asking about, trying to figure out the intent, and then empowering the agents or the automation to go and take an action or to return an answer on your behalf. There are a lot of commonalities there. And so we really focused on solving the problems for our customers, uh, which enables our technology to be applicable across different industries. Um, and yes, you did mention um, some of our investors. So we're fortunate, um, as we talked earlier, we've raised over 90 million in venture capital to date, including our recent uh, $65 million Series C that we announced in December of 2021. And um, we've been fortunate to raise from luminaries, including folks in, in, in the technology space like New Enterprise Associates, K9 Ventures, um, as well as luminaries outside of technology, including Ashton Kutcher, LL Cool J, um, Sean Diddy Combs, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Robert Downey Jr. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it's all, you know, it's cool to hear uh, the set of people that are backing us. But at the end of the day, what we like to think about is that all of these people are investing in Forethought because they resonate with the Forethought story and what we can become, what we can solve for our customers. And also, as you think more broadly, Forethought has the opportunity to, quote unquote, unlock human potential through artificial intelligence. It's how we like to think about our mission. And so um, a lot of these investors have been able to kind of see that vision and see what we can uh, we can become as a company. Well, congratulations. That is absolutely amazing. Um, customer service has always been really interesting to me and exciting. It has to do with problems and business challenges. It will never go away because we'll always have customer problems I would be interested to know, you have so many customers, you mentioned um, customer service and experience. It's been a great time for this industry because it's expanded. Now CMOs are interested in it. Who are you generally selling to within the company? Is it just the head of customer service or is it beyond that? Yeah, it's really interesting because customer service is now starting to become a spotlight across businesses everywhere. Uh, maybe five or 10 years ago, customer service was always seen as this cost center. It's something, oh, we have to have it to serve our customers, um, but let's you know reduce costs, let's do as little as we can in customer service. But that model has been flipped on its head, primarily with the advent um, and the rise of software as a service and in general, what you would call kind of the subscription economy or um, subscription businesses. What people are finding is that it takes a lot less to renew a dollar or to expand a customer than it does to go and find a new customer. And so retention, customer support, customer service, the customer experience is starting to become front and center for every single business leader, whether you are directly the director or VP of customer care or you're somebody in marketing or in customer success or you're the CEO of a business. So it's really starting to become front and center. Um, and that's been really helpful because that's exactly what we believe here at Forethought is that your customer support center is your intelligence center. It's the leading edge of um, knowing what products you should be building. For example, using AI, for example, like using Forethought, you can figure out that, hey, 20% of the issues coming in are about password reset or 13% are about um, uh, refunds, right? And, and these can turn into, hey, why don't you build this into your product or why don't you go and create content um, around this, this topic? And so we're seeing that a lot of these um, customer support leaders are starting to, or a, a lot of these business leaders are starting to look to customer support for, uh, for their insights. Yeah, Dion, because you and me have always known that the contact center is a gold mine of insights, but getting the senior execs to go into the contact center is not easy. Do you provide any type of support or thought leadership to these change agents that sometimes just have trouble getting attention in the company for the contact center and getting more resources? Yeah, exactly. So from a product perspective, and again, we like to think about ourselves throughout the life cycle of a journey. And so um, one, and, and you can kind of see our product names on our website, but we help solve problems, we help triage and route issues, and then we help assist those agents um, for, for the remaining issues that require that human touch, that require human judgment, we also assist the agents. 
But the last thing that we talk about is analyzing and discovering insights. And I think that's really, really core. And something that we do with all of our partners is help them and be a partner with them to understand where customer service is going, where their own customer support, where their own contact center is going, and how that can le uh, be leveraged to, to bring insights back to the rest of the organization. So a lot of our customers actually turn to us as a strategic partner, and it's really fun to, to get to do that because sometimes the solution isn't even to buy more forethought or whatever you might call it. Um, but sometimes the solution is to just really map out, okay, you're thinking about, say, your digital transformation this year. Well, how are you going to use the insights from your customers in order to go do that? And it's it's really fun because we've actually seen some of our you know customer service leaders get promoted into digital transformation or customer experience um, roles. And, and we love we love doing that. We love seeing that. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I know there's no shortage of um, information that is needed by these change agents because no one really goes to school to do customer service or customer experience. You just sort of fall into it and then you just become really great at solving problems and being resourceful. And I want to talk to you about AI because you have so much experience in AI. It is a much debated topic. Does AI create jobs, destroy jobs, especially with the contact center? There's still a lot of debate around that. What are your thoughts on AI in the contact center? Do you think it's creating jobs or destroying jobs or maybe a mix of both? Our fundamental belief at Forethought is that AI should be human-centered, and we kind of, you know, plaster that a, a, across our website, across our walls, um, and and so we think of AI like any transformative technology, right? Like think about the spreadsheets, for example. A lot of people were. Um, quite frightened that spreadsheets would put um, accountants out of a job, right? And 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 you know this today from talking to anyone in finance that the spreadsheet now has become the most important tool for them in order to uh, kind of get work done. And so I truly believe that AI is going to do something just like that for the broader economy in that AI is going to help um, for example, automate the mundane tasks. AI is going to help bring uh, leverage attention um, so that you know where to focus. For example, if you're a support leader, again, going back to that early example, AI can help you find out, hey, 20% of your issues are about password reset. Or when, uh, for example, COVID hit, um, a lot of our businesses, for example, if you're in HR um, software, a, a lot of our companies are in that space, they were starting to see trends like all of these new issues related to PPP loans um, and, and COVID and things like that. And so AI can not only help you uh, save time, but leverage your attention better or focus your attention, um, focus your energy better by, by bringing you to the problems uh, that you should be focused on and ultimately save money. And then at the, at the end of the day, this will enable humans, um, all of us, to focus on the areas of the business and focus on the areas of support that require things like empathy, human judgment, understanding. And ultimately, AI should help accelerate the ability for a customer to get to that empathetic human. So to answer your question, believe that AI will actually help us um, unlock human potential, uh, do more at work, do more jobs, and then actually open up previously unavailable jobs. So Dion, you mentioned you are a strategic partner, you work with clients directly. I would be interested, and I think our audience would be interested too, to hear what are some of the common challenges that your prospects and clients are coming to you with, maybe even new challenges since COVID that you hadn't seen before? So the first most obvious one is, um, particularly around COVID, uh, was that we were seeing this combination of two effects. One, digital transformation. And I think that's that word, even though it's being thrown around a lot, is actually happening. You know, they say there are um, decades where nothing happens, and then there are years where decades happen, right? And in 2020, 2021, the, the past couple of years have been um, pretty seminal in, in, in this kind of transformation. And I would argue it's probably going to happen even more so in 2022, as we talk a little bit more about um, this global recession that folks are predicting or that folks are arguing we're already in. Um, and so 
businesses are having to learn to do a lot more with a lot less and having to adapt to this changing ecosystem. And so that's one big thing that we're seeing is just the, the shift to the digital world, right? You take um, businesses in maybe grocery delivery and the mere fact that a lot more people were working from home and, and using digital services coming online for the first time saw these, these spikes in, in volumes and, and things like that. That's one. And then two, we're finding that um, particularly in COVID, but I think this is again going to be a, a deeper trend, is that people and humans and the ability to empower your workforce to do the best uh, they can, to, to live the, the best version of their lives, to do the best work of their lives is becoming increasingly important. In COVID, this was important because of the fact that you know people were sent home, work from home. We were seeing in contact centers and customer service uh, centers that they weren't equipped to work from home. They didn't have the the technology, the dialers, and all of these things. So the question became, how do we get them back to productivity? And now again, as we're seeing these shifts in the broader uh, climate, the question again becomes, okay, if we can't spend our way out of things, how do we take the team that we have and turn them into superhumans, so to speak? in order to be successful. And so those were the, the two challenges that we saw, this digital transformation as well as empowering teammates. And that was what we responded to and what we do help our businesses and, and clients uh, address um, in, in the customer support world. When we think of the technology stack, I think our audience would be interested to know where your software fits. Are your clients throwing away or getting rid of other pieces of the tech stack? Does your technology integrate well? Um, and what, like, what are your thoughts about that? Great question. So we do not replace your help center or your service desk or whatever, or your contact center, even the, the technology that your agents are using every single day to work and the technology that your um, customers are using to connect with you, to communicate with you. So we aren't the quote unquote system of engagement. Um, on the flip side, we integrate with your systems of engagement. So if you're a business, you're likely using something like a Zendesk or a Salesforce Service Cloud, a ServiceNow, an Intercom, et cetera, um, as part of your, your um, engagement stack. And we've been very, very deliberate about saying, hey, you know what, that part of the business is going to be crucial and continue to be crucial. But what we're seeing in this new wave of, of technology and what we're seeing in this new kind of era over the next decade is the system of intelligence is going to become a, a integral part of that equation as well. And so we integrate um, directly with those systems. Uh, we start to index, we read your conversation history, or at least the AI does, and then uses that to build a model, which you can then deploy to your website. So you can put a snippet on your website, replace your chatbot. We do replace your chatbot. Um, and so that's that's one thing we like to uh, talk about is, you know, legacy chatbots are a thing of the past. You can use something like a forethought in order to completely replace that stack. Um, and the, Or you can use our Chrome extension, which then fits into your agent's workspace that they can then use to um, search get suggest suggested answers, coaching, things like that. And so as you can see, we're actually a pretty nice um, add-on intelligence layer to the um, systems of engagement. Wow, it sounds like your product is something that a lot of companies need right now. And AI is a new ocean for them to explore, but it sounds like the product really uh, makes sense right now, considering what companies are struggling with. Thank you. Yeah, we, we're super excited and I feel super fortunate as well with respect to kind of the timing of, you know, when we decided to take that leap um, because, and this isn't talked about a lot, but in and around, I would say 2017, um, AI, particularly natural language understanding, took a, hit an inflection point, right? So about 10 years ago, with computer vision, for example, we saw that a similar inflection point. We were able to, you know, it started with um, handwriting. Could AI detect whether this was a, you know, a handwritten one or a handwritten two and so on and so forth. And we started to see a ton of research come out in that space, which led to this proliferation of new technology, new research, which is now leading to things like self-driving cars, all built on that technology. These are gonna be trillion dollar industries. And I actually think AI from a language perspective, um, and again, in and around 2017, 2018, 
um, with a with launch of many seminal models like BERT, GPT-3. These are all models uh, in the AI space, in the language understanding space that are as good or better than humans on certain language tasks. And so we're kind of in this, um, I would guess, 10-year sprint of technology, including the stuff we're building here at Forethought, that's going to make a huge transformation and a huge impact on customer service and I think um, even beyond. Well, I'm so excited for the ride and it's just been great being in this industry. I feel so blessed to be here. Uh, before we let you go, I want to help our audience get to know you a little bit with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready to take those? Um, let's do it. All right. All right, Dion, you are stuck on an island. You have access to water, but you can bring one other food and one other drink. What are they? All right, so I have access to water. I can bring food and drink. Hmm. Food. I, I don't know. I feel like potatoes. Mm. I don't know why, but like I'm thinking if I can only pick one thing, it's got to be a superfood. It's got to get you all the nutrients you need, and it's got to be easy to solve for. Uh, maybe that's my engineer brain coming. Um, and then drink. Um, what would I pick? I was going to say something tropical, but I feel like if I'm on an island, like my favorite fruits are like passion fruit, mango. So hopefully they're already on the island. So I don't I don't think I have anything to go for. If it isn't there, that's what I would pick. All right, cool. What is your most embarrassing work moment? Ooh, embarrassing work moment. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't had many embarrassing work moments. Ah, OK, actually, I will think of one or I, I can think of one. I love to do karaoke. Um, and so pretty much any time I do karaoke, I embarrass myself, um, but, uh, that's, that's all I've got. Yeah. Karaoke that you have to be pretty brave to do that. All right. Next question. <laughs> if you could have lunch with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Ooh, I've actually been asked this question. Ironically, it was pretty funny, but, um, so actually can I give two answers? Two answers. Yeah. One alive. Um, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, who's one of our investors and, and uh, one of my good friends and is also a founder, um, she's just super smart and, and very thoughtful. And so pretty much any option I get to have lunch with her would, is, is good. <laughs> um, dead, I would pick um, Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. um, this, he, he's, you know, he's kind of like a legend and cliche when you think about really, really smart people. But when you actually go back and look at some of the stuff he did and how he did thought experiments and how he was able to take really complex problems and simplify them, I would just love to just have a conversation with him. Yeah, yeah. What is the greatest music or band of all time? Ooh. Actually, I would probably say, I would, I would probably go somewhere between Drake and Ed Sheeran. Oh, have they collaborated <laughs> um, yet? I don't know, but they really should. Um, they're both really great for different reasons. And I think actually for, for similar reasons is that they've been able to take pop music or whatever element of pop music, but then make it iconic, right? Mm -hmm. in, in certain times. So anyway, that's, that's my answer. I'm going to leave it at that. All right. Awesome. Um, if you had $1 billion, what would you do with it first? Um invest it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I know that's probably a silly answer. I probably, well, what I would start thinking about is what are other <laughs> problems to be solved, whether it's in um, kind of energy or space or um, climate or, you know, just startups in general. And then I'd probably, I'm assuming this $1 billion just came from forethought. So I'd probably go and start another company or incubate or invest in other founders who are building these things. And lastly, what is one tool or resource you use to get through COVID? And it's a self-development tool or resource. Mm. I think... Um, I don't know if there's like a general or a specific thing, but I would say like um, one reading, <laughs> um, but two focusing on your or my um, health habits, right? So like I, I just think about getting through COVID is about or was about um, making sure that I'm healthy and healthy can mean a lot of different things. Like in the case of COVID, it can mean, you know, 
not getting sick, um, but it can also mean making sure that you're staying mentally, emotionally healthy in order to kind of continue to do what you need to do. And so for me, it's like playing basketball, um, things like that. And so those are probably where, where my mind would go if I had to solve or answer that question. Absolutely. Well, Dion, this has been so fun. I really appreciate you being here. If our listeners and viewers want to learn more about Forethought, where can they do that? Absolutely. You can find us at uh, www.forethought.ai. Feel free to request a demo or anything like that. I'm also pretty available um, and in terms of LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me. I'm just Dion Nicholas at, on LinkedIn. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or any of the other socials. And my at handle is at dojiboy9. Don't ask why. I may change it one day, but it's D-O-J-I-B-O-Y-9. <laughs> Um, but yeah, definitely reach out and happy to talk shop about customer experience, customer service and, and beyond. All right. Well, this has been great. All of you have been tuning into the modern customer podcast until next time. Uh-huh.